Um, this is based on my personal experience as a parent and in trying to nurture creativity my daughter. I have a 12-year-old daughter and she's got a bit of to handle at this point. Um, independent, which is good. I hope. Creative, so I think. And she is actually right now in London. Good for her. <laughs> she's actually in London with my sister-in-law and I'll show you some of the stuff she did while she was in London which I thought was Interesting, to put it one way. But uh, this talk tonight is going to be about nurturing creativity from a parent's standpoint, uh, based on what I've read and what I've done with respect to her. That's my name and that's my you know, email address. Uh, she's got her own website, so obviously I get daddyes at laurelv.org. Uh, if you want to take a look at my bio, I'll just run through it quickly. So I actually am born in JB. I'm a Malaysian. But I currently live in the U.S. right now, uh, specifically Orlando, Florida. <coughs> um, this is actually an event that's being held next month for Malaysian students. Well, in this case, for parents. And they asked me to write a bio, so I might as well do that. Um, here you go. It's kind of hard to read. Uh, basically, undergraduate computer science, MBA, you know, over-credential and totally clueless sometimes. Uh, as, a, as I said, as an MIT graduate, present at the MIT club where I live, the most important thing with respect to that is I'm actually quite well, uh, quite deeply involved with the uh, STEM activities that the MIT Alumni Association has. STEM, in this case, means science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So I'm actually part of a group within the MIT Alumni Association trying to foster greater appreciation, greater understanding, and greater part participation in STEM activities. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, as a parent, especially somebody with a, I guess, a MIT background, like, honey, you need to work really hard on your mathematics, you know, being an over anxious Asian parent, but she recently got a B plus on one of her math classes, so I was like, oh my gosh, that goes her, you know, academic <laughs> career. <laughs> so as a substitute penalty, I said, let's go up the place, up the Charles. If you all know Boston, uh, you all might know who that school that I'm referring to. Any idea? Harvard. Harvard. Yeah, it's a plan B there. Thank you, Mark. Yes, I know. Can't help it. Gotta, gotta tease them every once in a while. What did I just do? Okay, which one is the... Uh, huh? oh. Okay. Anyway, uh, this, is gonna be, this is based on my experience, my readings rather, first of all. Secondly, my experience with respect to my daughter. Right? Okay, first of all, the idea is that you know, creativity can be cultivated. So we talk about intelligence and creativity, but based upon the study that I read, a lot of IQ differences, you know, IQ, XYZ, whatever it might be, is attributable, attributable to genetics. I've seen studies that say the uh, numbers vary from 50, the various studies I see say it's 50, it's up to 80, but the range is between 50 to 80 percent of the child's intelligence is actually attributable to the parents and the ancestors. But in terms of creativity itself, it's only 30 percent. So the implication from that is that you can cultivate a person's creativity, your child's creativity in other words, right? So 30 percent of it goes with your genes, the rest is your attitude and mindset. The way I'll rephrase that is not attitude and mindset. The way I will, I will rephrase as attitude and approach. How you approach nurturing, cultivating creativity in your child. And I think that as a parent, you can help to nurture your children's creativity. It's something that you can actually do. And the thing I want to point out also is that creativity is not necessarily the same as intelligence. Right? It sort of falls out from the previous slide. When you talk about intelligence, it's 80% inheritable, but not necessarily creativity. There's a perception that just because you have good test scores, right, great grades, especially in a very test-oriented system that Malaysia has, Singapore has, that you're going to be creative, which is not necessarily true. William was uh, William back there from uh, from KL originally, now working in Singapore, was telling me a story about one of his students at O level who didn't do very well, who was considered to be a failure, but he recently saw the same student. I uh, was participating in a, was it a science fair? It is, it is called the Urban Prototyping Weekend. They were developing an app right. using big data sets mm -hmm. released by the government and the, the private organization. It, it, it's, it, 
It is a weekend hackathon. So this student who was not necessarily good academic, academic, academically, now is able to do something creative above and beyond what you know he or she, in this case he I assume was taught, right? So the evidence for creativity is to look for playful imagination, to look for somebody who's got the imagination that sort of flourishes within or without, within or outside the traditional uh, educational system. <clears throat> Somebody's doing, making things, exploring. That in itself indicates some level of creativity, <coughs> especially if you're a polymath. Not necessarily about mathematics, but somebody who's got multiple skills in multiple areas, essentially, which is actually a very interesting point. Uh, you'll notice that some of the really brilliant people have interests outside of, well, some of the scientific genius, geniuses, rather, have interests outside of science itself. I believe Einstein had a particularly fond pa passion and fascination with music. And then some others, but whose name I can't remember at this point, but I'll point to one particular example that will come, become clearer, clearer later on. So you can cultivate creativity, and how do you go about doing that? Right? So anyway, the genius IQ, in this case, uh, as exemplified by Richard Feynman, is about 120. From what I've seen, uh, the baseline is actually been established primarily with respect to Caucasians, actually North Americans. They established a baseline of about 100. Um, the, group, the ethnic group with the highest IQ is, I believe, Jewish. Ash Ashkenazi Jews, in fact, about 115, 118, thereabouts. Um, but going back to this point, intelligence and creativity are related to a certain level, to one thing, but above that, there's no correlation. Some of the Nobel Prize winners don't really score very high on IQ tests because it's not so much about intelligence, it's about attitude, it's about the approach they take to doing their work itself. Richard Feynman, 1965 Physics Nobel Prize laureate. Any idea what his test IQ was? Anyone? I'm sorry? 130 perhaps. Close? Yes. Any guess? 127. Well, it's, it's about 122 to 125. I've seen different numbers. Uh, do you know who's Marilyn uh, Von Vos Savant? Yeah, her IQ is 126. I heard it was 220. Oh, sorry, 220, yes. Yeah, okay. What is she doing? She's, she's writing columns, answering questions in an answer. Yeah. Really, she's not doing anything creative, truly. She's just a columnist, answering puzzles. So there's really, well, uh, uh, you know, up to this point, anyway. There's really no relation, strong correlation anyway between intelligence and creativity. So I want to point that out. So he's at 122. And, he's, and what's pretty awesome about Richard Feynman is he likes music. He's playing bongo drums. <laughs> uh, some of you may have read his books. Surely a Joking Mr. Feynman, which is actually a pretty interesting week, by the way. Well, he was at Los Alamos during World War II. He was, uh, had a habit of cracking saves just for the sheer fun of it. Right? And the security people was like, who's breaking into all our safe? He's like, oh, just doing for the fun of it. You know? I'm kind of a cool guy, basically. Very much a character. Um, basically, he would put some you know, in the safe, writing guess who. Yes, yeah. that's right. After number two or number three, they figured it out, I'm sure. <laughs> Especially same handwriting and sort of thing. The, you know, the government does have some military intelligence, though that sounds somewhat absolutely moronic sometimes. <laughs> so his IQ was not really something. But what was amazing is, you know, this guy's brilliant. Even other Nobel Prize winners were amazed at his sheer brilliance. Fascinating guy. I personally think that cultivating creativity is actually a parental respons responsibility, by the way. The reason is because despite the creativity classes that Malaysia is talking about, and let me focus on Malaysia for right now, Despite the fact that the government is supposedly trying to foster creativity in the classroom, the reality is this. Teachers do not actually want creative students. Why is that? Um, they ask to rank the students on you know, various personality matches, right? Individualistic, risk-seeking, accepting authority. The traits most closely aligned with creative thinking is closely associated with least favorite students. Because the creative students want to do something different. They do not want to conform. You're a troublemaker. You know, behave yourself. Sit down in your seat and keep quiet and do the lessons you're told. So the reality is most teachers, I'm not saying all teachers, 
On the average, teachers do not want creative students because they don't follow the rules, essentially. So that's not, not going to happen with teachers in the classroom. I think the responsibility falls to the parents. You cannot, I don't think it's actually easy to teach creativity. It has, to some extent, has to be modeled. And that's the responsibility of the parents. Um, by the way, all the slides I have, I try to put the citation, the references. So if you're interested, you can actually look at it, the source <coughs> from where I got the information from. Oh, this one got hammered. <laughs> um, this is actually, uh, there's actually a really good website, Creativity Post, where I actually, you know, sort of developed a lot of my thinking from there. Um, two parts to it. Thinking and doing like geniuses. Thinking about it, for example, Look at France in many different ways. This is one way to look at this statement. It's got cut out so you can figure it out for yourself. <laughs> in many different ways. So for example, with respect to my doctor, I say, honey, this is a problem. You can think about it, think about it inside out, outside in, left and right, upside down. You know, think about it in many different ways as possible. Okay? We tend to think linearly, linearly excuse me. I try, honey, why don't you back up and try to look at it from a different viewpoint? Uh, metaphorically, well, she's kind of young still, but I'm trying to help her with it. I'm trying to use analogies essentially. Um, I, I, I'll show you a little interesting example of how she's thinking metaphorically at this point. So think and do. One of the things I do with respect to my daughter when I, you know, talk about things with her, I try to make my thinking visible to her. I explain my reasoning to her, especially if I get upset with her. I say, "Honey, I'm upset with you because of X, Y, Z." So she'll understand it. So the th three things I share with her is what I'm upset about, why I'm upset about it, how can we work together so that I don't get upset with you, you don't do what I don't want you to do, and therefore I won't get upset with you. But at the same time, I put it in the context, honey, regardless of what you do, I love you the way you are, period. Right. Produce. If you want your child to produce, you, you must be setting a, a, a good example. I want my daughter to read. I read a lot, so therefore she reads a lot too. It's kind of things that my dad reads a lot. There must be something good about it. There must be something useful. That's why he's doing it so often. So she reads a lot too. Um, prepare themselves for, for what, what do you think this was? <laughs> change. change. Chance. 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 <laughs> right. <laughs> Not change, chance. Be open to interesting situations. Um, let me tell you an interesting story. This is a few years back. I was actually, the cause of the reason why I had to come back to Malaysia was not, was not particularly good. My mom had a stroke, so I was in the States. I came back, and, you know, I had to fly back the next day, essentially. So it was about six, seven something in the morning, and I was going through the security line. And there was a gentleman in front of me, you know, well-dressed gentleman, taking out his shoes, his belts, and so forth. One of those days when I'm like, uh, well, okay. But anyway, you know, I say, it is what it is. And he sort of, so I sort of say in a joking fashion to him, I guess we're all getting used to undressing in public. <laughs> <laughs> he looked around to me and smiled and said, yeah, I'm traveling halfway across the world. Okay? So he went through, I went through. Uh, of course, given the fact that he had to put his thumb back on, and I was like dressed in shorts and t shirt basically, and a pair of slippers. Crocs, excuse me, Crocs, my slippers, not like the flip ones that you get in Malaysia. Uh, I went through the cut, excuse me, not cut, the security after him, but I cleared all the stuff before him because he had to put on his belt, his shoes, and all the other stuff. See? So I headed out to the gate before he did. I got to the gate and says, okay, this is the gate, let me walk around a little bit. Okay? Wander, wander around. Wandering around, then I went back to the gate to get ready for the flight. Same guy was standing in front of the line, where I was. I said, hi, you're in front of me in line again. We started talking, this American gentleman, uh, Caucasian by the way. We started talking. So I say, where are you flying to? So I, I, we started talking and I say, so you got a long flight? He said, yes, I got a long flight too. So I asked him, where are you going to? Penang. You're flying to Penang? I'm flying to Singapore. I said, oh, okay, so we started talking. As it turns out, this American gentleman is a dato. <laughs> He's the CEO of... Anyone here from Penang? No? Uh, Penang Methodist? Adventist, excuse me. Yes. Okay, this gentleman turns out to be the CEO of Penang Adventist Hospital. <laughs> Sherlock. 
just by the chit chatting, totally you know off the cuff remark. Turns out to be dato tet. Is that tet more or tet lar? Remember, it's M O L. Turns out to be a dato. <laughs> <laughs> And we had a good chat, just, just from the sheer fact, it just happened to, you know, off, off the cuff remark. So it's interesting. So we both arrived in Singapore, he stayed the night because he had to fly the next day to Penang. So we chit chat, I we traded email addresses, I got back to JD, which is where I found my email him. So Ted, you know, hope you arrive safely back in Penang, so on and so forth. He emailed me back, he says, oh, I'm back in Penang, but I'm leaving the next few days back to the US. Like, this guy's a seasoned traveler. So I wrote back to him and says, two feelings about this. One, I'm envious because you're earning tons of frequent flyer miles. Especially when you're flying business class, by the way. But two, I'm sad for you because you're flying back to the US anyway. So it's one of those situations where it's pure luck. I happened to meet somebody like that. We had a good conversation going on. We talk about politics in Malaysia, by the way. <laughs> for whatever reason, you know, live in Malaysia sort of thing. Uh, it's, one, it's one of those situations where you can prepare yourself for chance. Things like that might happen, okay? Be open-minded to different opportunities might, that might turn up. And that's actually, to, I, I will have to say, it actually has happened to me quite a lot in my life. I'm truly, truly fortunate. Um, make novel combinations of things, and I'll get to that in a short while. This thing about false relationships, I'm not so sure about that, but that was in the creativity post I left it there at this point. But let me move on to the next slide, all right? Uh, do you know what puzzles are, what puzzles? Okay. What do you think this says? Sure. Huh? What else can it say? Think verbal, which you are, but think spatial. <clears throat> Space. What is this location? Initial in the box. Right? One of the things that you, this is what I do with respect. This actually comes out in the Florida paper every Sunday. My daughter and I attempt to figure out what quote unquote are the right answers. Not necessarily right answers, but plausible answers, okay? So the way I do it with my daughters, I keep talking, I keep talking. So we hopefully both agree on an answer. So she's actively engaging her mind and seeing me engage my mind. Not necessarily getting the answer right the first time, but I'm talking about it. I mean, get it wrong and I keep going. Go ahead. That's it. <laughs> yes, he's great! And do you have a mind value? <laughs> no. Oh. Yes. Thank you. What is what does this say? Is that B strip. Close. Okay. So, but I got these two. I couldn't get this one. When I when I tried this. No. Be long. Be long. <laughs> okay. If you can get this, I'm impressed because I couldn't get it. I stared at it for the longest time. <laughs> Any idea? Winning with ease. Oh. Uh. <laughs> okay, this one should, should be easy at this point. What does it say? Yeah. Hmm? Good, 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 good afternoon. afternoon. Right. So you gotta think not just verbal, you gotta think spatial, you see? So what I, this is what I do with my daughter on Sundays. We, awesome. we, we do it together so that she can see me trying. I don't succeed necessarily the first time. She sees me failing, right? Which is part of being creative. The ability to handle failure. Oh, I actually, I, not feeling it to me. It's just I'm I'm talking aloud. I'm talking my mind. I'm expressing my thoughts about what these could be essentially. All right. So the middle should have belong. As I said, this is really difficult. I should figure this one out. Yeah. And all the time, and all the weeks I've done this, I only got the all three of them correct once. Sometimes I get only one right. Like, oh my gosh! And my daughter will get two. She'll be like, hey, I'm better than that. <laughs> I wanted to think that way. That she has a possibility of doing better than me. Right? Okay, this is how I measure my daughter's creativity to some extent. Okay. Saki Sushi. Is that one here in KL? Yes. Yeah, yes. Have you guys seen this uh, so, uh, it's, uh, slogan? <laughs> <laughs> this is my daughter's take on it. Does that mean you eat people? <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried about your diet. <laughs> Do you know what she's getting at? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is being consumed? What is being served versus who is being served? <laughs> we think usually about what is being served. She's thinking about who is being served. <laughs> that's a viewpoint. So that's what she says. Does that mean you eat people? I'm worried about your diet. They serve only fish or crabs. Yeah, but who? <laughs> serving, in this case, serving what versus serving who? They're serving to 
Right. Is so but she's interpreting it in her own way. Yeah. She's opening her mind, you see. That's what I'm trying to encourage her to do. Be flexible. Try different things out. Don't just accept it at face value to some extent. This is what I'm really proud of her for doing. Uh, she's, she wrote her stories when she was 10, and thanks to Amazon's trick, it's in great space, she published her own book, about 100 wow. pages. The difficult part for me was editing it. <laughs> <laughs> I had to edit it. <laughs> What's really cool about this was, uh, do you know the play Ant Butterfly? So you might... Butterfly? Is Ant Butterfly and Butterfly? That's true. Yeah. Ant Butterfly and Ant Butterfly. But this guy, David Henry Huang, was the first Asian American to win a Tony, right? It turns out that last year, 2011, he was in Orlando, Florida. I brought my daughter to see him talk, just because I thought, you know, it's one way to open her mind, see what's up, kind of like the arts, theater, essentially, right? So here's a cool guy. Um, <coughs> is there any way for me to toggle over to webs, to the internet? Browser? Yeah. So can you do it to laurenlee.org? Mm -hmm. L A U R E N L E E dot R. And I, I tried to open her mind. I gave her the opportunities to expand her thinking, to explore different things. So this was last year. She has fun in life. All right. So he had a writing exercise, so she decided to scribble her own you know, thought about it. He said, use the phrases go, you're the rabbit. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Electric, something, 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 whatever. And she decided to write a story based on just the key phrases he, he threw out. Because it happened, last year happened to be you're the rabbit, he threw out the word rabbit. So she wrote, whatever. Okay? So, um, here's another thing out of sheer chance. That's David Henry Wong, first Asian American to win a Tony for M. Butterfly. That's my daughter. It's a bit shorter, actually. <coughs> Think about chance again. Mm. I brought a camera, wanting to take a picture of him with her. Camera malfunctions. Mm. <gasps> He's like, oh, no problem. Take a picture with my cell phone. Actually, it was an I, uh, iPhone. Okay? So, little mini problem. He graciously volunteered to take a picture. I took a picture, rather of the two of them using his iPhone. Notice, my camera malfunctioned, he offered to do it with his iPhone. He emailed it the same day to my daughter. I got home, emailed, oh, picture. I wrote back, say thank you very much, that was very nice of you. Check my camera, at home it worked. Okay? <laughs> the point of the story is this. Because my camera malfunctioned, because he emailed me, the picture, I now have his email address. <laughs> right? Okay, uh, which one is the... Uh... Okay, this is important to the story you can tell. I have his email address, which I will not have had if my camera worked correctly. My daughter was writing this thing, her stories, getting it, trying to, you know. I said, honey, why do you publish the story? You write a lot, you know, let's get it published. So, okay, sure. Then you do the editing. Oh my gosh, what did I get myself to do? So I thought about it, hey, why not get a celebrity first? <laughs> Who do I know who's a celebrity? Whose email do I have? Sherlock, David Henry Kwok. So we, e actually, I didn't email. I said, honey, do you want a celebrity blog? She said, what's that? Go Google it. <laughs> she Googled it. I said, okay, yeah, sure. I said, why don't you figure out what you're going to write to ask him for a blur? She wrote it herself. I looked at it and said, it's actually not bad. The right tone, so on and so forth. I corrected a few things, sent it out. And I actually emailed him a copy of her, her, her manuscript. It was about 100 pages. Uh, I hope he made it past the bunny story. <laughs> which was this one. <laughs> it's actually kind of funny. It's the story about bunny. The rest is, you know, lengthy, sorry, and all that. I thought, oh my gosh, 100 pages. But after a few days, he wrote back with this. Right? Sherlock. That my camera malfunctioned, which it shouldn't have because it was working correctly when I got home. Got his email address. And he decided to write a really nice blurb for my daughter, which I thought was really, really nice of him. Uh, so I'm so far impressed with the voice, artistic ambition, and talent. You know, sure. So that was pretty cool. I like. Uh, it's one of those things where things happen. 
By the way, it says hodgepodge, why? Because to me, that was just a hodgepodge of a story. She's on hodgepodge number four right now. I'm going to edit three more books. <laughs> oh my god, why am I going to do this summer? Edit three. <laughs> so I'm actually really proud of her for doing this. The story's number one, and number two, going forth to ask him for a blur. What was interesting is when she also, she also emailed him to thank him for the picture, she asked him, what is the end butterfly about? <laughs> you know, I saw the email, I was like, I hope he replies nicely. <laughs> I said, honey, do you think about it this way? As, it's like you asking Shakespeare, so what's Romeo and Juliet about? You know, what the hell is this story about? He wrote a nice, uh, about 80 word paragraph. Clean, simple explanation of his play. Cool. So I give her opportunity for opportunities like that present itself every once in a while through Sherlock. No, go for it. Okay, this is my daughter. Uh, can I click on it and it will launch YouTube? Sure, yeah. Okay. Sure, theory. Okay, I mean, we saw earlier about thank you, uh, my contribution to my daughter's creativity, the inherited part, so to speak. All right, this is my daughter. Is that sound? <coughs> Probably. But. I can always pretend to imitate her singing, uh, dancing. This I need to do. This is Mark. Mark. I'm actually going to show you my dad. That's him. But he is crazy. Good. And that's embarrassing. Yes, I'm embarrassed. Okay. Let's go back up marching. Marching up the hill. Marching down the hill. What's your favorite thing to do? Dun. Hello Kitty is very important in class that age. What she was doing basically is taking a camera phone and just doing it like this. The thing about the point is that she thinks I'm crazy and cuckoo. And for some reason that embarrasses her. Not sure why. <laughs> Where am I? Oh, keynote. Okay, that's what I'm using. Okay. So that's my contribution to my daughter's creativity in the sense that I try not to say I try to. Some of the stuff I end up doing tends to be perceived as crazy and cuckoo. Now this is an interesting one. Um, that sort of exemplifies the way I sometimes look at the world. I was actually at an MIT event in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I was talking to this gentleman for some time. I was quite animated about it, quite animated conversation, right? So he ends up saying, you know what? You got an effervescent personality. And after he said that, I have to stifle my, my desire to burst out laughing, because in a way he says, I'm a chimp. So the question is, you know, I, I actually didn't think about it. He said it, I thought it. He said I'm effervescent, or have an effervescent personality. I thought to myself, he's calling me a chimp. So I'm gonna trace to you, once I thought about it, why I thought he was saying I'm a chimp. Okay, starting with me, right? So what else is effervescent? <laughs> champagne, right? Okay. Now what is another name for champagne? Bubbly. And bubbly obviously means bubbles. Okay. So how does that relate to chimp? Anyone has a guess? I know, I know, I know. It's Michael Jackson. Yeah. That's right. Michael Jackson's chimp. <laughs> for whatever reason, that day I was having such a good conversation with this guy for all of that. I just stifled my desire to start laughing because I thought he was calling me a chimp. Just because he said I had, I had an effervescent personality. One of those weird things in life. Um, another story. Oh, well, this is questions and answers. The check mark is supposed to imply an answer. If you want another story about me being a little cuckoo, then it actually um, involves Harvard and Yale. Anyone from Harvard and Yale here? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's about toilet humor. Oh, I'll use it. These are some of the slides I sort of uh, compiled, but I did not actually end up using. Uh, it's nothing to do with creativity. I think this is a key thing to think about when you work. What kind of work do you want to do? Right? Anyway, uh, I like this quote because tackle big dreams has no competition. I like to do stuff like that. I'm actually in the midst of doing stuff like that, in fact. It's really cool. Okay, this is the. Um, <laughs> Story. This was actually an event in KL, the Oxbridge event. I was attending Ox Oxbridge event in KL for some reason. 
And actually, um, this is before he went into politics. I actually invited Tony Paul to join me because he's the Oxford guy. I knew him personally before he went into politics. I said, this is a story. Tony, you're going to come to the Oxford Street event uh, with me. Because otherwise, you know, I'm the only one there. I mean, I don't know anyone else, excuse me. I don't know anyone else there at the time. This is before any politics. No, no, too many people, uh, you know, don't like to socialize. See what has happened <laughs> since then? So anyway, the story is this. Uh, there was a lady, a uh, British lady, Patty something, Dato something, Patty Patty something, whatever, just telling a story about Harvard and Yale, which I didn't know at the time. So it's basically about you know, guys in the bathroom. Right. Harvard, they teach you to wash your hands after we pee. And Yale, they teach us not to piss on our hands. <laughs> I was listening to this story, well, this is really weird, we're having dinner. What the hell is all this about? And then she elaborated with, you know, the Oxford version of the story. The Cambridge version of the story. Strange. Dinner time, peeing, story, you write it, whatever. So anyway, I was sitting at a table with a bunch of, you know, Oxford, Cambridge guys, uh, Greg, excuse me. I was talking with this Cambridge graduate to the left of me for quite a bit. So he leans over to me and says, he knows from, I'm from MIT because one of those things you go to a social event like that, you, they ask for college affiliation. Yeah. Are you here, there, whatever? So I looked at him and gave him this answer MIT designs sensation systems for NASA. <laughs> you're making the assumption that you're on Earth as gravity. If there's no gravity, what do you think happens to the P? It floats. You've got different problems in life here. <laughs> he thought that was a different answer because it's, the typical answer will be let's be more you know profound or blah, 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 not say profound more like this kind of answers right I reframed the problem for him I gave him a different context entirely for the problem because the assumption that all these answers were making is that you're on Earth he said MIT guy I said MIT rocket scientist we do stuff on NASA there's no gravity different problem. So imagine if you're trying to pee, the thing will float. <laughs> he burst out laughing because it's an entirely unexpected answer to his question. I never answered his question, by the way. Right? I just gave him a different way to think about the answer. After that, he totally loosened up because he thought it was a novel answer. At the break, he says, you know, you got a different viewpoint. Can I ask you about the business strategy I'm doing? So if I, he was the CEO, he was, perhaps still is the CEO of financial services firm in GL. So he asked me, I was like, I have no clue about your business. But I still want you to listen just because, just in case you have a different insight to what I'm doing. Because it sometimes helps you have an outsider's perspective session. So fine. Listen, I was like, so long. Later on in the conversation at the dinner table, you know, it's going really well. British guy, Caucasian, his wife is Japanese. Very pretty by the way. So i talking to both of them, and I lean over and says, um, gentle thing, you know you have a very beautiful wife. Nice talk. He looked at me and says, did you say dutiful? D -T -I -F -I. <laughs> <laughs> Why was that what I said? The wife said, he said beautiful. I said, yes, I did say beautiful. Husband in trouble. <laughs> Let's put this way. He remembered me for two reasons. One for interesting insight, second for almost getting him into trouble. Must be the Malaysian accent every once in a while. Well, by the way, this is the first time I've been to any Oxbridge event in Malaysia. I'm so impressed with the number of Malaysians who have strong British accents. It's incredible. Even the Malay guys who are like, I can't believe. Really rich British accents. Oh, there was another event tonight <laughs> that I was going to go to, but this one took precedence. It's actually an MIT talk by a Nobel laureate, by the way. So I skipped that for this. This is more fun. <laughs> but also, this is not going to pay. <laughs> I don't remember the price, but this one definitely got to pay, so they don't want to go there. See, they're expensive, like, because it's American Club Nobel Prize glory, you know, so they're pay. Uh. It's all the hot, hot nobby with the Singapore MIT guys and all of that. Actually, they, uh, the Ivy League organizations in Singapore is actually very well handled. It's all group, uh, they work together, they collaborate with events. That's pretty much it. Um, as I said, if you're interested in this presentation, I'll put it up somewhere you can access it. The references are there. Um, so you can delve a little bit deeper in some of the things I looked at. Um, somebody mentioned something about 
21st century workforce. Creativity is obviously a key part, I understand. But I don't look at it from that standpoint. I look at a standpoint that it's an opportunity to express yourself, to be more than what you will otherwise be within the traditional education system. I don't care about the 21st century workforce period. I care about the fact that my daughter has the opportunity to do things that she might not otherwise have been able to do. The fact that it fits well into the 21st century workforce, you know, be creative, be adaptable, and so on. Fine. That's a nice tool. The key thing is that she has the opportunity <coughs> to learn to how to express herself, to think for herself, an independent thinker, um, adaptive and flexible. Case in point, she's 12, she can fly by herself. Oh, I'm too lazy to go home. Well, my wife's from Hong Kong, by the way, so granddaddy's in Hong Kong. It's like, ooh, she's 12. What airlines allow her to fly from Singapore to Hong Kong by herself? Check, 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 check. My, my brother in law is an executive who is one of the budget airlines in Singapore. We chose that one just to make sure if any problems, you can call me or yell at the people. So, got some, gets on the plane, flies to Hong Kong. Right now, Kong probably loses her passport. She gets on the plane, she loses her passport. She figures that out only when she gets the immigration in Hong Kong, right? No passport. Oh wow. Granddaddy waiting out there. One, we, we talk, we're thinking about an hour after she arrives to, you know, come out. Two hours later, still not out. What happened was that she realizes she loses her passport when she's about to hit, to, uh, hit the immigration line. Oops. Think for herself, what do I do? She goes back to the gate, tells them the problem. I said, okay, fine. Go to Lost and Found. Waits at Lost and Found, somebody finds it, she gets a passport back. All the way back to, you know, go through the immigration, pick out the bags and all that. Ends up two hours later, past arrival time. In the meantime, granddaddy calls my sister in law who's in Shanghai, who calls me while I'm in Singapore, who calls my wife who's in Orlando, Florida. Talking mini multinational crisis. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you want me to do? I'm a Singapore. You're in Hong Kong. Okay. Granddad's Hong Kong, but granddad is old. <coughs> the mix is Filipino, doesn't you know, speak a whole lot of English, or oh, Cantonese, what they're meant to. So they're all, we all like panicking. My daughter eventually walked and said, oh, I'm here. <laughs> Stress. Lesson not learned, obviously. We decided to fly her from Hong Kong to Shanghai solo. This time she learned her lesson, as my wife said, make sure you keep a close bank, your passport, your boarding pass, and your money. <laughs> the way I think about it is, I'm hoping that she learns to be independent, that she thinks for herself, which I hope which she is, I, I do, do believe so because of this particular episode of losing the passport, right? And she, she, she weathered it quite well. She told me the only time she cried, when she thought, she wasn't scared, she cried because she thought she's going to be scolded for losing her passport. I thought she was like, <laughs> I'm by myself, I'm cool, I'm happy. <coughs> she actually, she has actually been traveling since she was three years old, by the way. When she was eight, she said, Daddy, can I travel by myself? I'm done going with you. Anyway, that's my presentation. Sorry it took so long. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, don't leave just